Hi, I'm Ron Nutter, and welcome to another edition of Tech Bytes with Ron Nutter. So far, we've done a couple of videos on Open Media Vault, and now it's kind of time to revisit things a little bit to show you some of the tweaks that I've come up with, or adjustments, or you know, setting changes. However, you want to uh, talk about it. It's some things that I found that are going to let Open Media Vault work a little bit more for me. Before we get started, thank you to everyone who's been subscribing and reaching out to me with questions. I'm trying to get them answered as, as best I can. I've got a whole host of videos already planned. I've got more hardware on the way in. Some of it, in fact, arrived today. So it's it's always going to be a, oh, it's going to be kind of a moving target. But I think you're going to see there's a lot of good things coming down the pike. And we'll go to the next step now, and let's take a look at the setting changes that I made in Open Media Vault on my Raspberry Pi. Well, by the time you're watching this, you've probably had your own version of Open Media Vault up and running for probably a few days or a few weeks. I'm going to walk you through some things that I've made changes on my system, and this is something that I think you'll want to probably consider doing to yours as well. The first one is getting into the right time zone. Now, we're, I'm already in the Open Media Vault uh, portal, so we'll click on System, Date and Time. Now, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you start looking at the logs and when you're having a problem, having it in the right time zone is going to save you from having to translate things. So it's just... It's, simple as clicking down on the drop down arrow here and putting yourself into the right time zone if you leave it on well they say uct it's actually utc if you put it on that then you've always got to convert the time to what your actual time is and for the time server just leave it on pool.ndp.org it will find the nearest server and set itself accordingly now, something else that you want to think about doing, and this is, you can do this ideally when you're first starting your Open Media Vault setup, especially if you start with a single drive and then, and then go to uh, RAID 1 or mirror drives or maybe even RAID 5, is to label the drives. And here's what I mean by that. We'll click on Storage and Disks, and it's going to bring up, you see the two drives that I've already got. Well, it's got them labeled as SDA and SDB. Now, what I'm going to do on mine is I've got each drive labeled with its Linux device name, which is SDA or SDB, and I'm also labeling the USB hub. Not that it should make any difference in case they were to get moved around, but that way you know exactly where each specific drive is to plug in. Again, shouldn't make any difference, but you know I'd rather err on the side of caution. Now, with Open Media Vault, you do have an option if you want to run this wirely versus wired. I would suggest against using wireless, or I said wirelessly earlier. It's not really a proper name. And the reason for that is wireless, by its nature, unless you've got one of the latest and greatest wireless access points, is going to be half duplex. You're never really going to see the full bandwidth potential out of it. And with the Raspberry Pi 3 Plus, there are three B plus, you're simply going to get the better performance, I believe, out of the wired port. Now, something to consider doing is we also want to change the name. So if we go down to system and then network, now you see I've already got mine set up for OMV. Now, by default, it comes as Raspberry Pi. I've set mine to OMV because as I bring additional Raspberry Pis online, they default, especially using the Linux distribution that's made for the Raspberry Pis, it's going to default to Raspberry Pi. Well, this helps me find it that much easier within uh, my wireless router at home. Now, that brings up another point is setting a DHCP reservation or doing static IP. I would suggest using a DHCP reservation, and here's why. Unless you are very familiar with doing subnet masks and getting default gateways plugged in, 
And I'm not trying to scare you, but unless you're used to doing that, it will be far easier to, instead of going into network, into interfaces, and we can say, we'll, we'll say Ethernet here, and then plugging all that in is to just let the router handle that function for you. And then once you have identified the proper IP address that your router is currently assigning to it, go in and build a reservation based on that and with the MAC address that your Raspberry Pi has. And that way it comes up all the time. The only downside to that is if you were to change routers, you're going to lose that information unless you manually enter it over. But that's that's another time and we don't have to worry about that one there is a feature that i'm taking advantage of and i would suggest you consider doing the same now there is something called smart and that allows you to monitor the drive so if there's potentially it's either overheating or if the drive senses some sort of failure you're supposed to have some chances of being giving a little heads up so you'll go into storage smart and you'll click enable and then apply. And I've already done, had mine up and running for a few days, but I've got all the step by step in the description for this video. And once you do that, then you can enable it. First you have to turn on smart and then you enable it for each drive. And the big thing it does is it tells you the temperature of the drive. Now that may not seem like a big thing, but it, remember, in my case, and, and probably yours, you're running external USB drives. So it's important to know if one's running too hot. You may need to move it, depending on where else it is, or you may need to think about getting maybe a little bit of airflow if there's not a lot of air moving. But basically, it's you, you turn on the smart service, and then you will click on each drive. You'll click on edit, and you'll activate mirror you're not mirroring what am i saying you'll activate smart monitoring for that drive now you can even go so far as to enabling tests in it but i haven't gone that far i'm just simply using it as a monitoring point at this point in the process just to kind of watch it there is uh, another thing you need to remember in case you happen to misplace your web portal password now remember you're going to have two separate passwords for omv one for secure shell which is is handy to have if, when you feel comfortable with getting in under the hood but in case you happen to lock yourself out of the web portal using a command called omv dash first aid it will allow you to reset the web portal password but that has to be done from secure shell login so that's a reason to have it don't know that you'll ever need to have it because if you did like I did when you first set this up, what did you do when you first got everything up and running? You wrote down the usernames and passwords and you put them in a password manager. So it's unlikely that you would ever need it, but it's handy to know about that command. Now, the two big things that we need to make sure that you know we're all comfortable with is when you go to shut down Open Media Vault, and I don't leave mine running all the time. If I'm going to go for better part of a day and not use it, again, because I'm using USB hard drives, which were not meant for prolonged operation, I will shut down Open Media Vault. And, you, and I had to remind myself of this. Please do not just pull the power to the Raspberry Pi and to your USB drives, you potentially could end up with some file corruption and or the system having to rebuild the mirror link. So what you'll want to do is when you go to do a shutdown, you'll anywhere from any of the pages in the Open Media Vault menu or portal, you will just click on that little down arrow and go to shutdown, and then it will do a controlled shutdown of not only OMV, but make sure that the drives are gracefully disconnected from it and powered down and not necessarily powered down but it will make sure that there's nothing going on so that you can then pull the power without risk of any damage because you'll still see a power light on the raspberry pi you will still see your your usb drives being powered up so 
that's just something. It's an extra step to take care of. And if you do leave it running a lot, that's fine. But I would strongly encourage in the event you've got a storm moving into the area, especially one that might have some lightning to it, is to shut down your open media vault implementation. Now, one additional thing that's also on the important list to do is we want to make sure that updates get applied because you would like to avoid problems that have been fixed that maybe you didn't know you might be having, right? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll click on System, Update Management. Now, see, at this point, I've, got our, I've already done my updates, but there's two more showing. So we'll click on Package Information and see both of those have already now been highlighted, and we'll just click on Upgrade. And it's going to go out and get the files that it needs. And it won't take but, oh, probably a couple of minutes to get those downloaded and installed. And that's the beauty of going through the web interface is if you're not familiar with doing updates from the command line in Linux, this makes it so much easier. So really, for the most part, that's, that's it. You know, knowing how to do the updates, I would get it up and running, although it ideally you probably should get your updates done before you even put your first drive online. It's not a problem if you don't. So that's really, as you can see, it, it's very straightforward to work with Open Media Vault. It, and it has the ability, even with as straightforward as the interface is, it has the ability to, to grow with you. Say today you're running on a Raspberry Pi. Tomorrow you may put it on a, uh, a regular PC with hard drives that are meant for, for a more heavy duty cycle. So it's, you know, it's a start and it gives you a feel for what to do. Plus, you know, it, it's a handy little portable NAS that you can put in a briefcase at a moment's notice. So anyway, it, uh, we, we've got more to, to come. Um, Probably I'm going to be a few weeks before I go to RAID 5. Right now, I'm I'm just kind of getting used to the different options in Open Media Vault and figuring out where I want to go. I, I do want to go to RAID 5. Ultimately, that's where I think I'm going to going to have to go just for redundancy because right now I've got two two terabyte drives. Effectively, I've only got one two terabyte drive because it's at fifty percent overhead that I wouldn't. That I, that I can't use directly because it's mirroring the first one. Now I may very well go to to a third drive, and this is where I'm going to look. Obviously, taking my own medicine, I'm going to back up what's on the RAID one mirror right now, and we'll back that off to a drive because I'm going to see if I can just add in, just much like I thought the directions were there, and it said I could just add a drive to an existing one and get mirror uh, RAID 1 mirroring to work. Well, obviously, we both saw in that video it didn't happen. So I'm hoping that RAID 5 will be a little bit different. But if it isn't, you know, at least I'm prepared and I've gone through the process. And I'm just hopefully saving you some, some headaches and, and heartburn along the way. As I alluded to earlier, we've got a lot more coming. There's things that are going on within... The other smart home technology, I've had some pieces, parts come in. We're going to do a video here shortly on the different tools that you probably want to have. And you may have some of these already, but as you're probably finding out, there's a lot of tools you don't have or that itsy bitsy screwdriver that is not even a jeweler screwdriver. It's got some head that you probably or, or bit pattern to it you've never seen before. Anyway, that's where we're going with all this. I just want this to be as helpful to you as it can. Thank you for watching the channel. If you uh, know somebody who is interested in doing their own smart home, please forward them a link to this channel. I've also got this available as an audio podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn. It's also available as a flash briefing for those of you who have the Madam A hierarchy. So thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you again soon.